Perfect. Okay, it seems to be working. Uh, hopefully, uh, all the attendees are on mute. All good. Uh, yeah, well, I think it was yeah a few a few years ago. Um, yeah, you're still at Station F by that time. I was still at Station F, and a lot of things happened since then. So uh, I went from Station F to Zbox, and I think maybe to get started, I can give you a bit of an overview of what we do, and for the people online as well to understand what we do at, at Zbox. So we are an international network of incubators and accelerators. So we currently have uh, three hub up and running, one in Marseille in the south of France, one in Arlington, uh, Virginia in the US, one in Guadeloupe, French Caribbean. And the reason we wanted to chat with you as well is because we're gonna open our first hub in uh, Africa. We're gonna be based in Ivory Coast in Abidjan. And so obviously for the entire Zbox community, as well as for us, the team, uh, like we want to download as much information as possible, get to know the ecosystem, um, we will open in June this year, so I don't know if you will still be in Barcelona by then, but if you can join us in Abidjan, that would be amazing. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the purpose of this call is really to uh, get to understand your perspective on the ecosystem. Obviously, you have seen the ecosystem skyrocket and develop over the past few years. Uh, so we want to get your perspective, download information and, uh, and uh, yeah, and get to know you better as well. Um, so. I think that's done for kind of an introduction about Zbox. Can you tell us a bit about 500 and, and your, your path as well and what you've been doing over the past few years? Sure, uh, and, and also thank you for, for that intro. Very exciting to hear that you guys are opening in Abidjan. Uh, I myself am from Senegal, so, so Abidjan is, is close to home. Um, so 500, we are an early stage VC fund based out of Silicon Valley. We primarily, uh, invest in, in tech companies. Uh, we've now been investing in, in more than 80 different countries, um, also multi-stage, uh, so have, have really invested in, in companies across their life cycle. Um, something specific about us is that uh, we were born in Silicon Valley, but over time have really, really been kind of one of the early investors to be going into emerging markets. So, uh, you know, we we have now invested in, in, in so many different emerging markets and it remains a priority for us in terms of the type of um, geographies that we want to enter, but also just being able to enter, um, you know, as a, as a first mover. Uh, we today have invested in um, more than 100 African um, companies. I think it's 100 and... 20 but don't quote me on that uh but definitely have have been quite active on the continent um and looking to do more okay sounds great and if you can tell us a little bit about how you've been seeing the ecosystem develop over the past few years we obviously see a lot of hub i would say emerging in like english speaking africa as well as french speaking africa where would you say are the main hubs right now and how have you seen them develop over the past few years so I think the ecosystem has quite changed over time, uh, for sure, because, you know, in in 2013, uh, at the, the very dawn of anything that is tech related, um, we, we were seeing kind of emerging sparks in terms of um, venture capital starting to even be a conversation and, and tech companies to even start to be on the radar if they were specifically kind of small tech companies instead of being either SMEs or being big corporations. So it was, you know, even starting to, to set those foundations. Um, of course, when you look at, you know, from, from 2013 all the way to now, 2023, so basically 10 years later, um, the markets that we have the most data on and that we've seen kind of a, a stronger performance have definitely been some of the stronger Anglophone markets, we call them. So also called the big fours, um, and I'm, I'm referring here to Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, and Egypt. Uh, so those are the, the markets that have been able to actually show uh, two things. One, it's a growth over time in terms of the type of capital that they attract um, and in, in the actual specific performance of the companies that you see. So them actually being able to get to later stages of performance over time. And the second thing that they've shown on those four markets has been consistency. So year over year over year, these are markets that 
come up uh, within the top four. Um, and these are markets that are showing a very consistent level of growth in terms of attracting investment capital, but also in terms of the number of startups that grow in those markets um, every year. Of course, from a, a more macroeconomic perspective, you know, there is a correlation between the performance of these markets and the actual size of them. Uh, so of course, you know, they they also happen to be some of the bigger um, economies on the continent and, and that correlation is not um, unusual and also is, is not something that, you know, when we're looking at all of these markets, something that we cannot kind of decipher to have a correlation. So there is definitely a correlation. Now, that being said, um, we've also seen what we're now calling newcomers. So those are markets that um, are either you know, have interesting um, factors when it comes to just the overall performance of the economy over the last few years. So there is a significant also consistent in terms of growth. They're not necessarily kind of that top tier, high growth, high population market, but they're showing some level of consistency in terms of macroeconomic growth. Or uh, there are markets that have been able to specifically focus on certain competitive advantages. Um, when it comes to building their ecosystem as a whole, they're not necessarily going to wanting to do everything all at once. They just are kind of very focused on a very specific segment that they want to transform into a competitive advantage, whether it be a regulatory competitive advantage or it be um, kind of a specific type of capital or a sector um, or kind of leveraging their geographical location to be able to, to, to act as an influential actor. So those markets often, which, you know, I call newcomers, um, you'll see that a few names uh, will will come out and will range depending on, on who you're talking to. But at least for me, the ones that I really put in that category are Ghana, Senegal, um, Morocco, Ivory Coast, um, and Uganda, as a matter of fact, and uh, we'll also add there Tunisia and Ethiopia. So often, right, those are markets that don't necessarily come to, to hand uh, when you think about um, what would be kind of the new go-to. Uh, but I think some of the work that they were doing, and then one last one that I forgot was Rwanda, because I, I thought about the regulatory framework and Rwanda came to mind. So these are kind of some of the markets that we can think about when we think about, you know, where is it that there is now some potential uh, to, to go look for. That being said, I think even within the big four markets, there is still so much untapped potential um, in the sense that, yes, they do score a lot higher than the remaining of the African countries, but I think that they're still heavily underserved in terms of capital, in terms of you know resources, training, uh, number of companies per capita and all that. And I, I want to get into a very European question, but I would say that as a continent, Europe gained maturity when it comes to tech and to startups over the past, I would say, five to seven years. Like we've really seen, and I'm excluding London that has been kind of following the path of the, of the US. But if I think about Paris or Southern Europe or even Germany, like we've been really gaining maturity as ecosystems over the past five to seven years. And over time, we kind of discovered the specificities of Europe and one of the specificity is sometimes for founder, the difficulties and challenges that they have into scaling within Europe because of the cultural differences, the, 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 the barrier in languages, the difference in taste when it comes to products as well. Um, so when we look at Africa as a continent and the different market that you just mentioned, the big fours and up and coming ecosystems, it, what is the level of, I would say, cross-border or the level of ambition if tomorrow I'm a founder and I build my company from Cairo or from Lagos or from Abidjan, how quickly can I go Africa-wide when it comes to a market and how strong are the local specificities um, to each of those markets? Okay. So to the question, you know, I'll, 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 I'll try to break the, the question into a few different pieces, which is um, starting with the context, I think that indeed the, the context on the continent is quite, um, it's quite unusual because you have a continent that has 
first that the highest number of countries in, in the continent. So it is quite fragmented in the fact that just structurally, right? There are just so many countries in one continent, which actually increases the level of complexity. But then something that for me even, you know, doubles the level of complexity when you're comparing it to, for example, Europe or other markets where founders need to scale quite rapidly is that um, Africa is an interesting continent because there are so many differences between the countries and the regions. And then at the same time, so many similarities. So you're kind of in, in a situation where the companies that are actually able to scale successfully are those that understand where are the similarities and where are the differences. And it's not always so intuitive because, um, for instance, when you take Francophone Africa as an example, um, you know, similar language, um, because they use some very, very similar regulatory framework because they're part of the same regulatory group. You know, the same rules basically applies to most Francophone countries, you know, laterally. And then, you know, they have similar, a similar currency. So in a lot of cases, also kind of similar deployment can be made. But also even within, you know, the Francophone countries, there are differences that are specifically related to something you mentioned earlier, for example, taste of product, how to market, um, how to actually build a user experience. What are some of the priorities that you have to think about when you're looking at from a, you know, a customer journey from beginning to end? So there are some nuances. And often I think that you know, either um, we're too focused on the differences or we're too focused on the similarities. And then there is kind of like a death trap that comes from that um, and that makes it for, more challenging for companies to the scale. And I think that, you know, really the, the, the true insight comes from really understanding what are the key similarities between these markets? What are the key differences between these markets? And from where a company stands today and where their expansion strategy stands today, where would most of the costs go if they decided to either lean on the similarities or lean on the differences. And that can actually also inform their decision on how and where to expand. Because it's not always the, 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 the kind of, you know, a natural um, type of, of, of growth that happens. And this also happens to European companies is when you're looking at expanding, you often want to expand to your neighbors. And that's just very, very, very classic, right? Um, because, you know, the psychological assumption is that your neighbor is probably more similar to you than the country that's, you know, two, three steps removed. So, you know, you, you, you're, and you're likely to believe that either cultural similarities or structural similarities um, will make it easier for you to expand in that market, given whether you're a product-led company or you're a market inside led company, or even if you're a consumer-led company. And that's not always the case. So on the continent, you actually see that sometimes it might make more sense to expand either, you know, from Kenya to all the way to Nigeria, or that it might make more sense to, to expand from Kenya to Cairo. Or very similarly, sometimes, you know, if you're based in Rwanda, it might make more sense for you to expand to Uganda than it would to necessarily expand directly to Nairobi. So I think some of these nuances, right, are, are key in being able to, to really establish and create a growth strategy among, those, among the African markets that is truly relevant to a specific company or to a specific product. So, you know, that's that's one piece. The second piece, which is like, when did should actually start thinking about this? I think they should start thinking about this from the beginning. And the reason why is not necessarily because, and, and it's not, my, my take on this is, it's not necessarily because of the usual reasoning, which is, you know, you should always look to expand 
to bigger markets, better markets, um, because you want to have a, a more sizable footprint and that's why you need to expand. I don't necessarily see it that way because I think actually some of the African markets are in often cases, it's actually a lot more strategic to get really deep roots and, and really gain significant market share in that market before starting putting resources into deploying in other markets. So I don't necessarily think that they need to start thinking about it from the beginning because of that reasoning of wanting to kind of get a little bit of each pie instead of having a much bigger stance in one. But because unfortunately, you know, one of the realities among the continent is that a lot of these countries experience ongoing economic and political instability. And what that means is that for a lot of these smaller startups and tech companies, often, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of factors that influence their performance can be linked to that economic and political stability. And because you're not able to, uh, and I think you are never really able in, in those circumstances to vouch for the ongoing economic and political stability of the country, you should always, in the back of your mind, have a plan on how to make sure that you can diversify your risk and therefore you can diversify the markets that you have access to just to make sure that you kind of have a little bit more of a penetrated approach in, in a few markets so that it can shelter you from potential instabilities that can happen at the local level. That's very clear. And it, it really also relates to some things that we see in Europe when it comes to the stickiness of product. Like we see companies that obviously, I don't know, do well in France or do well in the UK and like start the expansion plan after a strong series A or a strong series B and they launch new markets and very quickly they can see either or not they have a stickiness and sometimes the stickiness comes from very unexpected countries as well uh, and so sometimes like the test and learn approach on expanding into new countries can be the, the right approach and I also really like what you said about a, a good way to shield you from potential instability in the country is to actually expand quite quickly and have a footprint kind of in several places at once because uh, if there is instability into just one of those countries, you can actually continue to operate in the other. So uh, thank you for that. I actually wanted to also structure our discussion around the three key pillars of what I believe is kind of the core of what we see in a strong ecosystem, um, funding, talent, and I would say the, the policy and regulatory environment. Uh, and speaking of Africa and speaking specifically about the, the, the funding environment to, to start with, um, I pull out some numbers and in 2022, we've seen like VC investments really, um, I would say slow down globally uh, to about 35%. And in the same period, uh, the, the African VC ecosystem still grew by 8%. So two questions for you. How can we, uh, how can we explain that resilience that continues growth? And second uh, question is more related to, um, I would say the amount of foreign uh, investors that invest in Africa versus local LPs that we see emerging as well. So on the question on how can we explain that growth, I'll, I'll start by saying um, we will need to wait a little bit to make sure that uh, the growth can be sustained and, and, and therefore then we would actually have more of a, a strong foot to be able to explain its growth because I, I think you know a part of it is that you know last year was was a was a quite challenging year for VC and tech. Um, this year has not been easier either. So I think that you know we're we're we really need to pay attention a lot more to how the ecosystem is going to be performing this year uh, to be able to understand whether the growth that happened last year is actually sustained on a again, consistent level, or if it was a, an outlier. So that's one thing. But aside from that, I think that, you know, the, the, the growth can definitely be partly justified by one, um, the actual continued growth of local investors. I think that that's quite critical to making an ecosystem sustainable over the long period. And that also touches into your second question about international investors. I think it's really important that there is an ongoing, strong, growing basis of local 
VC investors who are able to uh, kind of be there in the good times and be there in the hard times and, and sustain the winters and be continuously and actively deploying capital into um, some of these companies, especially at the local level, because also that's actually really on the long term, what will inform um, international investors' interests to be able to see such a dynamic and active and, and, and resilient um, local investor bases. So one, I think, you know, a big of it is that it is to the merit of the local investors who I think have tremendously contributed to making and continuing to work towards making the ecosystem more resilient. The second piece um, that also, you know, explains um, this continuous growth is just Africa is still so underpenetrated when, when you think about um, the, the ratio of capital available and opportunities. So um, even though, right, the numbers are growing and even though there is kind of ongoing effort to um, see able to see how, how this growth is going to sustain over time, it is still so underpenetrated because you, you still have so many opportunities in so many sectors that are still so untapped that, you know, at the end of the day, I think even from local or international investor perspective, even in, in markets that are um, more challenging and tougher, there is still an ongoing factual and rational recognition of the opportunity because we can still see that there is exponential population growth. There is yeah. still a, a growth of the middle class there is still a, a, a big growth in consumption. There's still big growth in unlocking sectors. And, and now more so, more and more, there is an ongoing will from the public and private sector to be able to actually localize production and to be able to localize um, technology. So and and so if when you put all these things combined, even in, in more challenging times, um, you will still have a recognition of that opportunity. And then overall, I think, you know, International investors are important in every ecosystem because um, they are able to also kind of help. So, you know, when when companies, I think it's when companies are at an early stage, you know, early and local investors are critical because they really help build the foundation. And also they're really the ones that can help these companies get a foot into those markets, right? Because they're the ones that can also leverage their network, leverage their positioning in the market to really help their companies grow. So I think they they play an instrumental role at that level at that level and even more. And um, there cannot be a resilient ecosystem without a resilient network of local investors. Now, I think the goal and the hope uh, for for every ecosystem is to bring and build winners, winners that can not only be winners in the markets that they're in, but they can also be winners in other emerging markets. Because, like I said in the beginning, when you when you see, um, you know, Africa is, has great potential because of where we are today. But um, when you turn on your on your left, you know, Latin America has incredible also potential going. You turn on your right, Southeast Asia, unbelievable. So I think um and again going back to, to my point of you know making sure that we're building companies that are resilient that are winners that are able to prove healthy unity economics and also that are able to grow and expand into markets that have similarities that allow them to really diversify their market pool and that allow them to really have kind of that um viability and also that relevance over the next coming years because when you're building a company i used to say that actually a lot before when you're building a company it's not just about you know whether or not what you're building in this company is going to be relevant for the next two three years the question is is what you're building going to be relevant in the next five ten years will people still think that this is a useful and brings value and brings value to the customer brings value to the market brings value um in some forms or shape in the next five ten years so I, I think that, you know, you still, and, and in that regard, you need international investors to be able to, to have interest in the market. You need them to have knowledge of the market and you need them to also be able to rely a lot on, on the local investors to make informed decisions in those markets. And so 
you know, in every given market, even in the more mature markets, you see that it's really important to continue cultivating the interest of international investors coming in. I mean, even here in Europe, um, there is still ongoing work and ongoing kind of sure. work, both in the public and the private sector, to keep on bringing international investors to Europe because we know that it's very important for these ecosystems to be, you know, viable over the long term to be able to, to attract also outside capital. Yeah, making a parallel to Europe is we struggled at the beginning at getting, I would say, business angels to understand the this asset class, which is venture. If you look at the percentage of investment from business angel in Europe versus the US, there is definitely like an under, I would say, understanding of what venture is as an asset class, where like in the US, um, I would say money flows more easily between successful entrepreneurs and successful uh, professionals that happily reinvest continuously within the ecosystem. So I would say like education over what an asset class, like what is venture as an asset class? And I would say on, on, on higher late stage uh, type of VC funds, this is one of Europe's uh, biggest challenge right now. Like how do you fund companies at the series C level, D, pre-IPO? How do you IPO them within Europe as well? And, and, and without having them turning to uh, um, Asian or North American investors as well. So on that specific component on how well of, um, how big is the knowledge regarding the venture asset class in, in, I would say successful entrepreneurial ecosystems that currently exist in Africa? So venture as a class is, is, is new. Uh, that's just frankly, the truth. Um, the same way that you know, tech entrepreneurship in that regard is also new. Uh, something that I also, you know, try to, you know, I keep saying as well is, entrepreneurship itself is not new on the continent uh, because you know, African economies are driven by entrepreneurs. They are driven by entrepreneurs in the formal sector and they're driven by entrepreneurs in the informal sector. Um, there is an absolute widespread uh, mentality of building your own business it is it is it is definitely not um a widespread culture of employees i always say it's a widespread culture of entrepreneurs um and and you see that massively in the informal sector massively um people are are, are have so many types of different you know small owned businesses that they run in so many different types of sectors that you could think about um that for me, you know, the entrepreneurial culture itself is already very embedded. Um, Can you tell us, sorry to interrupt you, but you, you mentioned something very important, which is the informal sector. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about what it is? Because it's not well known and it's something that I discovered not so long ago, actually, and I was quite amazed. So the informal sector um, is the, the, the actual backbone of, of the African economy, if, if you may say it that way because when you look at um a lot of the ongoing struggle from a you know public uh institution perspective has always been how do you actually how can you measure and record all the growth and economic development that is happening in the informal sector if the nature of the sector is that it's informal right so um, something that I think is, is so unique to emerging markets that you might not see as much in, in Europe or in the US is um, the majority of the economic activity happens in the informal sector. So the majority of businesses, the majority of transaction, the majority of um, because, you know, often, especially with, you know, e-commerce companies or fintech companies, we'll talk a lot about transaction volume. Um, the majority of that happens completely outside of the formal sector. So it is that it's it's happening in a, in a fashion that is not recorded, that is not properly taxed or even taxed at all, um, not in a matter that uh, is also able to be predicted in the way that the, the formal sector can be. And so when you look at the numbers, often uh, we call it the, you know, the, the some call it the black economy or the underground economy. 
It's just this massive, massive um, economic activity going on across different African countries that is just simply not recorded in um, the typical channels through which you'll be able to kind of both measure and collect data on 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 employment, collect data on on um, enterprise size, enterprise numbers, transaction volumes, and all that. So it's completely out of that spectrum, and but it is the majority. So it actually forms the backbone. And you know, often when we speak of things like uh, you know the the reason why mobile money has been such uh, you know kind of putting some light into what's going on in the informal sector is mobile money is the first type of financial transaction tool that has actually made its way through the informal sector because the informal sector is not banked and it's not willing to be banked either so you know a big a big hurdle and issue over that for over a period of time had been, you know, people trying to, to, to say that the reason is that there is no enough you know, banking solutions. But no, it's just because the solutions, which are banking solutions, are just not adapted to that informal economy. So today, I think a big challenge um, for especially the tech sector is how to leverage on that as a strength and not as a weakness. Um, how to actually use the informal sector activity as a um, source of opportunity rather than either ignoring it or um, trying to formalize it into existing solutions because that has already proven not to work. And same goes as, by the way, for insurance as a sector, right? Um, formal tools of insurance just doesn't work uh, for, for the informal sector. And so I think there is now especially with some of the type of solutions that we're seeing being, being developed on the continent, there is suddenly kind of that awakening to realize that this, this informal sector is truly the backbone of the economic activity. And if you want to build a resilient company, you have to appeal to this mass that you cannot fully understand um, by looking at data shards. And I think that that's critical. So a very concrete question. Imagine that I am a, a business out of from like uh, Asia, from the US, from Singapore, from Paris, whatever. And I want to penetrate the African market um, knowing that there is this informal sector. Like I have institutional investors, I am regulated. How am I supposed to, or how can I land um, in, in, in an ecosystem where the informal sector is so important and I still have, I'm regulated, I have to follow international policies and stuff. Like, how am I supposed to approach that question? Thankfully, now there are two things that are starting to grow. Um, there's still a lot of room for, for improvement. But one is there's been more and more work that has been done now by um, data collect type of institution to encompasses a little bit more the informal sector. So there's been now a lot more work that's being done in how do we actually, what are the right tools to measure what's going on in the informal sector? Because before it was a matter of just the tools were not appropriate, right? If, you, if you're trying to use banking and, and trying to use data on the banks to be able to understand, you know, how, what is the, what is, what is the um, business dynamic of, a city or of a location, you would just simply get it wrong because the 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 people who are banked represent such small portion of the economic activity because most people are actually unbanked. They're completely unbanked. And um others would try and another way that people used to try would be using taxes. So using public uh record and using public available publicly made um, records from in public institutions to be able to find um, data on and going through using basically tax records to understand um, some of the dynamic of the economic activity. Also, again, you would completely get it wrong because it doesn't even, it doesn't even nearly uh, put half of the picture together of what's actually going on. So I think in terms of tools, uh, we're getting better at understanding what are the ways in which to, to understand that activity. The second part is, and, and that's kind of the, the, the harsher part of the answer, is that 
international companies that are looking to expand on the continent have to adapt. And that is the, the simple and that is the, the, the direct and that is the, the true answer, which is often the idea has been how do we basically mold our clientele to be able to fit in our given um, structure and uh, make sure that in that way, we are able to, to basically penetrate these markets with the solutions that we have and that we think work. The truth is, that's not how it works. Um, these companies have to adapt. And, they, and by the way, this is not something that is either new or specific to the continent. Because when you look at another incredibly big market that we often refer to, which is the U.S. market, uh, which is one of the biggest single markets in the world, um, a lot of companies, especially a lot of European companies or international standard companies, um, when they expand to the U.S., they will have a U.S. branch. And that U.S. branch is often completely different, even in the way that the entity is structured. So because the entity has to, co to be able to cope under U.S. regulations, but also they will make a lot of different kind of adaptation and molding to what that entity actually is serving to its customers, just because they understand that it is a lot easier for them to adapt to the market than the market to adapt to them, because that's the other way around will happen. And then same thing also goes for, for Europe, even before, not so much, but recently a lot more because, you know, the European Union has taken very specific stands on data protection, on the environment. And so even international companies expanding to Europe have to often have their own kind of Europe branch or unit. And that will also have services that are very different often sometimes than their other branches because they have to adapt and they have to kind of adapt to reality. So same goes when expanding to the continent. And, um, you know, I can understand that 20 years ago, they they might have felt like there was one lot less data, which is true, to rely on. Um, and also kind of just a lot less clarity as well on how do you navigate the local nuances if you're operating from afar. Now we, we have more data. We also do know now that it's incredibly difficult to helicopter in, right? You have to build local teams. You have to build local entities. You just have to be able to actually understand the market that you're operating in by building and bringing human resources that are local so that you can actually adapt and, and you have to be willing to adapt. That's awesome. I didn't think we would cover the informal sector, but I think it's it's very crucial because um, a lot of people outside of, of Africa, which uh, which is my case, like I had no idea about the size of this informal sector and the specificities that come with that informal sector. So very glad we got to touch upon it. We touched about we touched upon uh, the funding ecosystem as well. I want to talk about talent for for a little bit and specifically about very blunt and easy question strength and weaknesses about the current state of the local talent for founders trying to build up their teams. Uh, within Africa. I'm fully aware that there is, um, I would say, um, massive specificities from country to country, and we cannot do a, a generality over, over the entire continent, obviously. But if you had to share a, a specific, specific strength and weaknesses of the ecosystem, what would you say? I would put it uh, in two folds. Uh, for me, you know, the, the, the strength is in, in kind of the bucket of the talent that we see on the continent, um, and again, this is not generalized to all markets, obviously, it's to a various degree, is that you will see that, you know, there is really kind of this hustler mindset that is really ingrained into um, the talented founders, the talented employees. People are incredibly kind of willing to learn, willing to, 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 to put their hand and make really get to the bottom of things um you will see that even ranging from you know early to, to later employees um you know talented individuals are incredibly hands-on there is a very strong desire for for them to be able to work in these companies especially tech companies so young people have a you know, they they find that, especially you know, in a in a continent as well that is grappling with an upcoming youth um, that is not necessarily going to find matches to all of their employment needs. So I think they find the tech sector incredibly exciting. Um, they are 
very, very kind of, you know, have that grit and have that willingness to really work um, things through. And you don't always see that often, right? I, I think, you know, it really depends on market to market, but often it is true that, you know, there is a correlation between, uh, you know, credentials and, and the lack of, of really wanting to, to get your hands dirty, basically. So, I think even from the founder's perspective, you know, what I'm seeing is, is there's just so much grit and so much resilience. So, you know, these, they, they, they deal with so many more obstacles every day than, than, than most people really do that it builds in them a resilient. It also builds in them this kind of solution driven mindset approach where they rather kind of literally go right away, looking into the solutions and dwell on the problems um, and that gives them a competitive edge because it really gives them that ability to um, always find solutions, really, and, and really do so much more with less. So with less resources, they're able to do so much more in terms of efficiency, in terms of timeline, in terms of like getting able to get, you know, from products to market. So I think that that's really a strength that the local talent ecosystem has and, and that, you know, I've observed over, over the last few years. Now, in terms of the, the weaknesses, I think, you know, the, the, for me, the primary and, and most, I think, obvious, mis, you know, weakness from my perspective is there is, there is so little access and there's so little reference to best practice that you just see, you know, that it 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 does um, impede on their ability to execute uh, mm-hmm. often, and it, it it's really kind of you know, and and you you see it. I, I even used to say when, when I used to to live in Senegal as well. You even see it in corporations as well. So this is not something that is specific to tech companies because they're early because they're young absolutely not it's how many examples of breast practices do they have access to at the local level that really allows them to see understand practice and believe that you can run a company with the standard of best practices um, and and a few corporations on the continent are able to do that. Um, there are also corporations that are not able to do that. So even if you're taking, you know, somebody quite senior from a corporation, bringing him to a startup, he's coming in with some of these practices. Some are good and some are not great. Um, and so it kind of passes down to through the chain. And you know, part of the solution that you know has been really an approach historically on on the continent to try to help you know build in some of these best practices has been oh you know sending people abroad for school sending them abroad for work and then they 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 learn some some best practices and come back but i don't really think that that's necessarily sustainable because one only very very few of them have access to that and second some of the, you know, what they believe often to be standards of best practices in certain countries may very much not be at all. But again, they have such little comparative that they don't really have the ability or access to the information to be able to compare. So I think, you know, from a from a local perspective and from a talent perspective, we really need to find a way to, to you know, come together in some forms of way and define certain best practices and best standards for the African ecosystem that everyone is working towards trying to apply um, at the big level for corporations and at the small level for for small and and medium enterprises and really try to then help, you know, these people who are so talented, who have so much grit, who just have, they, they have everything really that you need to be able to build fiery companies and be able to build very great and talented individuals but they just need kind of you know a little bit more help on on having best practices that are applicable to their local circumstances so not a copy and paste and also not you know just purely write bad practices they need you know best practices that are adapted to their local circumstances 
It's very interesting that you touched upon uh, something that we don't see in many ecosystems, but you talked about that that grid and that hustling and that like energy, where we see a lot of other emerging ecosystems from highly developed countries where their main struggle is to actually convince youth to turn to entrepreneurship versus uh, turning to a large corporation and become an employee into your career, which is a great path, but trying to have a lot of the youth that actually turns to entrepreneurship to drive innovation and really help like uh, move the country and the ecosystem forward. So I would say like this is a, a massive differentiator uh, that is probably fueling the, 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 the growth of the ecosystems there. Um, I want to touch upon as well quickly the regulatory environment because we talked about the informal sector and sometimes how difficult it might be for uh, newly formed startups to navigate the, the policies in place. Sometimes there is just like no frame that exists. Sometimes they are actually brought in to help craft that uh, regulatory environment. What would you say is the role today of policymakers and regulators that you interact with, I know, um, what, what is their role and how can they help build a frame to empower more startups to launch uh, uh, in Africa in general? So, you know, regulators and policies, it, it's always kind of, you know, a hot potato because everybody takes it and, and is throwing it at each other. I think there are two, two separate things though. And often we mix them together um, and they don't have the same role and they don't have the same effects. Policies inform initiatives. Regulators regulate. So they they have they have very different um very different kind of end goals in the sense that a policy is supposed to be set to encourage a certain type of initiative, certain type of behavior. It's really how to incentivize to get to an X, Y, and Z. Regulators and the point of regulations is to regulate and, and make sure that we can prevent and inhibit um, and basically sanction behaviors that are not adequate with what has been decided. And, you know, currently, and, and that's also, I mean, it, it is a reflection of the fact that, you know, the same way that the entrepreneurship sector is, is growing, so is the policy uh, and kind of the, the policy and regulation governmental arms, because they're trying to figure out what is this this what is this new thing going on um and how do we get ahead of it by creating policies that will really drive growth in the direction that we want um and how do we create regulations that can help us um regulate and also by the way often by the moment you get to having to put a regulation often that means that you're already too late mm -hmm. because you know, policies are proactive and they allow you that you basically have a step ahead of what is happening. Regulators and regulations always come in often when it's 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 too late. Something has happened and now we need to put something in place to regulate. Um, and I think, you know, there's been multiple different initiatives that I think are 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 great for the ecosystem and have really proven to be really, really the step in the right direction, uh, which are, you know, the startup acts that we've seen in Tunisia and Senegal and in a few other countries where the government has really tried to bring in all of the different type of ecosystem players from accelerators, investors, founders, um, sit around a table and figure out, okay, how do we basically create a policy? The startup act is a policy. How do you create a policy that will incentivize the type of tech entrepreneurship that we believe as a country, because every country has their own agenda, that we believe as a country will further um, our X, Y, and Z agenda and our X, Y, and Z growth in these priorities that we have. And I think every country should do that work. Um, I know that not all countries have passed Startup Act or, or even putting it on the table or have even considered it. Um, and every single country might have their own reasoning why. Um, I, I would strongly encourage for that to happen. And even, you know, 
even more so for me that, you know, the Startup Act was it was a good, not even because of the resulting policies that came out of it, which I, th I think are great, but even just for the mere fact of having all of these different actors sit down and talk with the government, but repeatedly, not once, not you know, at a at a event or a round table, and then you know they take notes, and then they say, okay, we'll we'll take all these things into consideration and get back. No, it's like, you know, the startup act involves time and activity and repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated sessions where there is input and output, input and output from both sides. So that really creates an exercise that really forces all parties to really think about how do we make this viable. So I think from the policy side that needs to happen more. And um, I think that more and more, you know, we need to get to, to push policymakers um, at the government level to engage in that conversation and to, you know, put these working groups towards building sort of acts and, and, and really making it a priority that, you know, every country should have one. So that's on the policy side. Now on the regulation side, um, I think that you know often uh, what has been what has been coming up is um, the role of regulators in 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 African markets and certain African markets. Um, up to this day, in a lot of cases, right, it's still so unclear because the regulators. Um, have in certain cases acted, in some cases not. Um, there, see, there, there seem to be so much just arbitrage and arbitrary um, kind of approach towards regulation that there, there just hasn't been, you know, a clear guidelines that have been put out by regulators that say, you know, if you do X, Y, Z, and Z, here is what's going to happen. And I think that that is the work that on the regulation side, we really need, people need clarity. It's, it's not so much that, you know, people think that, oh, the regulators are not involved or that the regulators are not doing their job or that the regulators don't understand it, because, yeah, in some cases, they also don't understand. Um, but I think that the, the bigger push is first on clarity because once there is clarity, which is like, what are, what are, what are the rules, right? What exactly are the rules? Only from there, there can be work towards, you know, helping the regulators understand and see that in certain sectors or in certain circumstances, there needs to be more work done towards making sure that these technologies can be viably tested or that they can be, um, so that these companies can actually work um, viably over a certain period of time. So I think on the, you know, the first step on regulation is clarity. Once there is clarity, then there can be actual work and conversation. Same thing on the policy side. But the difference between the policy side and the regulation side is on the policy side, policy is really about, you know, creation. So it, it makes sense that you start from nothing and you go towards something because you really, um, you, you know, you're coming to the table, you're, you're really bringing in all actors and you're trying to work together towards creating something. On the regulation side, it's really challenging to work with regulators if there is just no framework to begin with. If there is no starting point, if there is not a clarity, a guideline to start from to say, hey, well, you know, here are comparison and here are ways in which we could, you know, work in a way that works better for everyone then it's a little challenging, right? Because it's, 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 uh, nobody wants to come and sit down to create rules, right? Like no one wants to, no, no, you know, ecosystem actor wants to sit down and say, you know, here are the rules that I think you should start enforcing. And here are the rules that I think make sense because, you know, if, if it was up to everybody, there would be very little rules. Um, so I think it's, 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 it would be a great step forward if there could be more clarity, from the regulator side, and then you know, coming to meet with with ecosystem players, say, hey, here's what we're proposing from a regulatory perspective. What are your thoughts, and what are the things that you think are going to work, and those that are not? Thanks a lot, Mami. Well, we touched upon funding, we touched upon talent, we touched about uh, the public sector. Uh, I, I see that the time is flying, but I wanted to ask like a very, very last question, which is extremely selfish. <laughs> about us, about ZBox, we are about to, to launch our uh, first uh, accelerator and incubator in West Africa, in Abidjan. And we are really an ecosystem enabler, meaning that we are really trying, especially when it comes to the economical net 
locally to connect startups with corporates that are well established that are trying to innovate a little bit better. Um, if you look at a structure like us, how would you approach arriving in Africa for the first time? And what do you think should be our kind of key um, initiatives that we should develop quickly to be useful? Okay. Um, I think, so I'll respond to that question in two, two, two parts. Uh, one is what I think you should think about um, as like a key element for you guys. And then the other is what I think could be of use and help to the ecosystem. The one thing I think you guys should have on top of mind and you should keep really kind of like a, as an ongoing thought, and I say this, by the way, to all accelerators on the continent, it's figuring out the appropriate business model. You will be surprised to the extent of which um, you know, accelerators on the continent grapple with that uh, because, um, you know, the, just sometimes the reality of just there are so many, there's just so many places to help and there are so many things to be done um, that it can be challenging to really figure out, you know, what is the, the right line of focus that really works for the business and works for the community. And, you know, there is like that product market fit in that regard. And, and sticking to that as much as possible because, you know, the more you, you will try to, the more you uncover it, the more you'll see that it's actually an onion pill. There are just so many different ways to get to the root issue, right? Because once you stop targeting this, you realize that this is actually affected by this other thing. And then you try to fix that and you realize, oh, actually, this is a consequence of this other thing. So, you know, that's the one thing that I would, you know, ask you guys to have on top of mind. And then in terms of like, you know, where they could be used. I mean, there's so, there's just so many places um, where the continent needs support. But I think something that I'm personally curious to see more of and that I would like to see more of is, you know, accelerators um, and actually in that regard, more incubators and accelerators that are really able to support companies in sector, mm -hmm. sectors that are specific, whether it be deep tech, whether it be, um SaaS, whether it be whatever it is, um, I think you know, a part of why it, sometimes it can be so overwhelming for companies is um they have such little access to sector specific experts or to sector specific knowledge or to sector even sector specific talent. Um, and I think there is a really big added value for um, you know, programs or supporting programs that can really horning into specific given sector and help them grow and that could be at the early at the mid at the early to mid stage um and i think that that is applicable for companies that are across markets i don't think it's market specific and that's kind of a perfect transition because we are indeed sector specific so we are backed by cma cgm group which is a, a world leader in uh, in logistics supply chain and shipping mm -hmm. uh and so obviously we have a specific eye uh, on uh, and, and a knowledge when it comes to uh, logistic, supply chain, shipping, transportation. Um, so we focus not only on that, but obviously we have a specific eye when it comes to project that touch upon uh, the, the supply chain in general. Um, I, I want to be very uh, respectful of your time. So I just want to say a massive thank you for taking the time to, uh, to uh, come with us today. Uh, I see, I don't know if it's uh, how to reach out to Miami. We are a Zbox Startups. Um, so, Valerie, is it possible to share a contact or yes. um, please yeah, okay. share my email with anybody who wants to reach out to me and I'm happy to talk with them. That's awesome. So anybody in the chat who would like to get in touch with Marime, feel free to send me an email uh, directly and I'll put you in touch with, with Marime who will tell you more about 500, the activities that they do, not only in Africa, but all over the world. Um, and Marime, I'm going to send you an invitation as well uh, in June. If you have time to come to mm -hmm. Abidjan to the opening, uh, we would love to have you there. So, awesome. yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And have a great evening, everyone. Cheers. Ciao, ciao.